What is up, freaks? It's your boy Marty here to introduce this episode of Tales from the Crypt. I had the immense pleasure of sitting down with Amita Utarwar, Bitcoin Core contributor working at Zappo. And Matt joined us for this one uh, to jump into what Amiti is working on in terms of rebroadcasting transactions to help uh, privacy at the P2P level of Bitcoin. Um, talked about a bunch of other things. Amiti started uh, contributing to Bitcoin Core in February of last year, uh, and she's been on quite the journey. She's uh, done the chain code residency, uh, worked at Coinbase. She's done a bunch of things. Uh, and now she's uh, head down building some dope stuff for the P2P layer of Bitcoin. Uh, we also jumped into her piece uh, onboarding to Bitcoin Core, uh, which she wrote in February of this year, basically explaining the journey she took, the resources she um, used, used, utilized to uh, basically get up to speed with what's going on in the code base, how uh, she interacted with other developers and, and gave some advice for anybody on the sidelines who's looking in and thinking about jumping in to contribute to Bitcoin Core. Highly recommend you guys go check out that piece uh, as well as this episode. Obviously, if you're already here listening to it, you're going to check it out. This episode of Tales from the Crypt is brought to you by our good friends at the Cash App. You freaks already know all about them. They're helping us do many things. They're helping us stack sats. They're helping us stack slivers of stocks if you want to. And they have their boost program. Let's go back to the stacks. Sat stacking? God, every time. Uh, uh, if you freaks haven't noticed on Twitter, they started rolling out their DCA function. Uh I've been teasing it for weeks, maybe a month now. I don't have to say soon TM anymore. It seems that they're rolling out the dollar cost average function uh, for stacking sats as we speak. I've seen many screenshots, uh, so you'll be able to set a cadence for uh, a, a, a go-to sat stack. If you want to do it daily, weekly, monthly, you can set an amount, set it, and forget it. Again, adding to the the buy pressure uh, from the retail investors. Incredible, incredible uh, announcement. And again, the, t- the product team at Cash App is crushing it, specifically uh, on the Bitcoin side. Um, so you can stack sats, send sats, receive sats, uh, sell sats if you so please. And now you can DCA sats as well. And sats are the standard. Again, via Cash App Investing, you can stack slivers of stonks if you want to. You don't have to. The option is there. If you have a favorite stonk and it's too expensive, Cash App Investing is letting you buy as little as $1 because Cash App is directly connected to your bank account or even if it is your bank account because now they're offering account numbers and routing numbers. So Cash App can be your bank account. You can get your paychecks direct deposited to the Cash App. Uh, You don't have to wait four to five days to start stacking sats or investing. You can start doing that today. All right. Cash App Investing is a subsidiary square member SIPC. As always, when you download the Cash App, if you haven't done so yet, make sure you use the code stacking sats. That's one word, S-T-A-C-K-I-N-G-S-A-T-S. You're going to get $10 and $10 is going to go to our good friends at Owls of the Cross in Chicago doing great things. Uh, not that dirtbag Al. He's doing all these happy hours and stuff. He's really, I hopped on his happy hour on Friday just to see what was going on. And he had a picture of me in the background, like a true creep. And he gave me a Hitler stash. It's, he's a disgusting human being, a scumbag. All right. He's not Owls Lacrosse, which is a very, very good charity, very near and dear to our hearts. They're doing incredible work for the youth in Chicago. Use the code stacking sats, download it now. Owls Lacrosse is going to get $10. Enjoy this episode with a meaty. I think you guys are really going to like it. She's a breath of fresh air. Somebody's incredible, per- incredible person working on Bitcoin Core. Enjoy it. Take care. You've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free. If you talk about a Fed just gone nuts, all, all the central banks going nuts. So it's all acting like safe haven. I believe that in a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. It's your boy Marty Bent here 
on a Wednesday evening. It's five o'clock. Long day for your boy. Been working all day. Very happy to finally be sitting down and uh, about to enjoy a nice conversation about Bitcoin, Bitcoin Core specifically. I'm joined by Matt Odell for this interview. Matt, how are we? What's up, freaks? And we're sitting down with a moody. Uh, Moody, I got your first name. I, I said it right before we hit record. I'm going to get your name mixed up. Amidi Utarwar, uh, Bitcoin Core contributor at Zappo. Amidi, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Really appreciate uh, you taking some time to sit down with us and talk about your journey to Bitcoin Core. Uh, we, we just had like a 20-minute pre-recording conversation, and, and it's been fascinating to me doing research on uh on you and what you've worked on uh to date that you've only been contributing to bitcoin core for a little over a year now um so that's one thing we want to jump into during this conversation is you wrote a a very uh good piece about getting introduced to bitcoin core and how one might approach uh contributing to bitcoin core if they're new uh, for your year anniversary of contributing Um, but before we get into that and um the work you've been doing uh, at Forecore. Uh, what were you doing before Bitcoin? How'd you find Bitcoin? Uh, what brought you to this weird rabbit hole that we're in? So I don't remember exactly how I found Bitcoin. Uh, one of two of my earliest memories are one watching a TED talk on what is a blockchain, and two. Uh, after a day of scuba diving in Monterey, reading the Bitcoin white paper. Very, very different levels of exposure. <laughs> uh, but prior to, prior to working on Bitcoin full time, I was working at Coinbase, clearly after I fell down the rabbit hole. And prior to that, when I didn't know what the words crypto or blockchain meant, I was working at a company called Symbi, which is a online marketplace for bartering services. So really awesome community, never quite took off as a platform, but had a great niche community on it. And I did a lot of exchanges and trades with random people of services, like I would teach them yoga and get a free massage, or somebody would teach me how to cook their, uh, I learned how to poach a chicken, uh, which was actually delicious. (laughs) <laughs> lots of lots of random services and I think fundamentally at that time I started I was a couple years into working and I started really questioning our monetary system and what wealth is because I think for me it's a lot more than having a big number in my bank account it has more to do with being able to invest that in my own wellness whether that is uh, services like I love getting massages, for example, <laughs> um, or or if I have a health issue or like eating well, et cetera, et cetera, um, as well as like having fun, indulging, traveling. So I realized that money is supposed to serve this, but has become so convoluted. And via Simbi, I was able to receive a lot of these things in these really enriching interactions with other people. So I think that was where my ideas of how our economic system supposed to serve us, but isn't quite started to seed. And so I was primed for when I learned about Bitcoin. I, I, I was pretty much immediately hooked. I read the white paper and then I was spending my nights and weekends. And this was the first time that I did something remotely professional in my free time. Otherwise I'm an outdoor enthusiast who like, okay, it's the weekend. Let's go backpacking. <laughs> um, so I, I knew I knew something was up. <laughs> yeah, no, I want to go back to one thing. You read the white paper for the first time after scuba diving in Monterey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What a uh, good day. <laughs> what, are the, what are the scuba scenes like in Monterey? There's no reefs there, uh, are there? It's, it, it, there's no, um, it's not coral reefs, but it's incredible. It's, there's a lot of, oh my gosh, it's been so long since I've been, but <laughs> between the Bitcoin habit and the lockdown, <laughs> but there's a lot of different animals. There's otters and seals and tiny little nudie branches and um, all sorts of random sea slug sorts of things. And I've seen jellyfish and octopus. 
So there's quite a lot going on, but it's a very different, it's not the classic tropical color palette. It's more like dark purples, dark greens, and uh, that sort of stuff. But it's, it's quite challenging. You have, it's really cold, so you have to wear a dry suit, and there's mostly only shore diving, and it's low visibility. So if you know much about scuba diving, that sounds not ideal. But I promise you, it's so worth it. And it's, I've been to a bunch of tropical places, but Monterey is up there in one of my all-time favorite places I've ever dived. And Dovin? What did you... Doved? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dived? Doved? Dovin? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, a, I'm not a professional diver. But would you have an epiphany underwater? Like, how oh, I should read this white paper. <laughs> I really, I can't explain. I have no idea. Yeah. I just remember. That seems like the best way to get introduced to the white papers when you have a clear <laughs> mind after scuba diving and seeing that, that beautiful landscape. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely, it was a great evening activity. Yeah. And then I saw on your Twitter, you uh, go to the Sierras to hike as well. Yes, I love backpacking and I love the Sierras. Yeah. I, um, my sister lives in Colorado and she's been doing a ton of hiking in the mountains and it just makes me jealous. Uh, <laughs> crazy jealous seeing the scenes on our Instagram. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. But so you worked at Coinbase. What were you doing for them before you started contributing to Core? I was on the crypto operations team. So we were the team that integrated with the different assets. Ah, was that uh, you? Are you happier to be focused on one asset at uh, at this point? Um. I really loved the people I work with at Coinbase. I met a lot of wonderful, nerdy, sociable people, but I definitely am happier with the work that I'm doing now. It's really cool to be diving into the Bitcoin protocol and trying to understand it and improve it. Yeah. So to dive into that, like, what was it like first approaching it, uh, con contributing to Core? I mean, you wrote a piece on it and how daunting was it for you personally? Was it daunting at all? <laughs> Oh my God, of course. <laughs> I, I don't even know if we can talk in past tense. Maybe it's, it's still kind of terrifying, but probably different levels of terror. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think it was really shocking to me that I could contribute something valuable and get any changes merged and a huge uh, learning experience to even do some of the basics, like I got feedback around my Git commits or that my email associated was my Coinbase email instead of my personal email. And um, just getting familiar with the Git repo at all. But I think it's, it's always different levels of scary, but really important to find ways to create something along where your learning curve is. And I think that was kind of the fundamental idea I was trying to convey in the onboarding piece. It's so easy to get overwhelmed um, in all of the different developments and uh, constant ideation that's occurring to think that you have to understand everything in order to start at all. And I don't think that, um, I mean, I definitely wouldn't be already contributing to Bitcoin because there's so much I still don't get. <laughs> I, I think it's it's been really surprising to me how the the repo has really a uh, great need for more attention, more critical minds, and you could probably find a way to add value regardless of what level you're at. Yeah. So did you find that uh, you were sort of starting your journey in Bitcoin Core with anybody else? Like, do you have any any coding buddies that uh, that you turn to or have learned with along the way? Um, I, I mean, no like specific buddies, but I've definitely learned so much from a lot of different people. Uh, John Newberry and Marco Falk were definitely the main core contributors that were giving me feedback and helping me figure out tasks to do and, um, like all over reviewing my PRs, which is super helpful. And again, terrifying <laughs> but there was also some people at coinbase that i would um like 
try to talk about fundamental concepts with or um, someone who knew C++ and I'd ask really dumb questions to. Um, and then I think I've also found a lot of online communities along the way to ask those basic Git, basic C++ questions so I can direct my Bitcoin questions towards anyone who's willing to be a resource to me um, and not utilize their, their the attention and their time span for uh, the things I can figure out elsewhere. But that's I was just thinking about that today. It's kind of shocking that I found the internet filled with kind strangers because I feel like that's not that's not the general uh, rap of strangers on the internet. <laughs> but just today, yeah, someone mean, on a Discord channel was explaining um, how like variables are assigned in the underlying C++ in a very specific way. And I was just like, wow, thank you so much, kind stranger. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, all right, it is interesting how the internet works in that way. It's, it's certainly easy to find, uh, find hate and, and vitriol on the internet, specifically on Twitter. Um, but uh, I find at least like the more uh, focused uh, an internet sort of community is, the, the, more, the more willing people are, are to help out and then with bitcoin particularly it's mm -hmm. like hey we're we're all trying to build out a distributed peer-to-peer -peer cash system uh, we're going to need all the help we can get so it's probably advantageous to be nice along the way even though there is uh some strong opinions and strong voices in the in the space i, th I found at least in the developer community everybody's been willing uh to answer my dumb questions with <laughs> with a smile on their face um yeah definitely um a huge difference in the tone of the Twitter Bitcoin community <laughs> versus the Bitcoin core developer community. I've been wonderfully surprised to see how open and receptive and welcoming to questions and skepticism and willing to share like learning and knowledge with me that almost every single Bitcoin core developer I've met has been. So that was a great surprise. Yeah. And back to your onboarding piece, so there's some books like uh, Grokking Bitcoin, Mastering Bitcoin, and then you've mentioned it already, learning C++, like how, how important is it to do that stuff before you get into this uh, or while you're doing it? Uh, how much did that help you learn? Uh, I've read, I can see Mastering book, Bitcoin right behind you right now. Um, it's a... Uh, <laughs> It actually helped me out a lot. Somebody's not a developer, just understanding the, the mechanics, how the peer-to-peer -peer network works, how UTXO works as an input, and yada, 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 all that stuff. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to have some conceptual fundamentals, but it's really hard because you don't know how much versus what's missing or um, at what point you're like, that's enough. Let's let's go do something. Um but I mean, in all honesty, I've read parts and of mastering Bitcoin and programming Bitcoin, and I've learned a ton from them, but I've never read them cover to cover. I've always intended to, <laughs> but I'm just much more of a hands-on tinkery kind of person. So I've, it's been a really nice direction for my learning to have something useful that I'm working on in Bitcoin that's like actually valuable because then I'll go and I'll do all the detail oriented learning in order to serve what my goal is. And it helps like create focus. It helps keep me motivated. Um, so I still, I still open up these books sometimes and like, like refresh my memory or if there's an area that I just am trying to get the high level understanding before looking at exactly the code, like they're great resources. And I think um, they're, they're wonderfully written in the way that they are accessible to a wide audience. But I also think that, I mean, it's, it's different personality types, but sometimes it's easy to say like, Oh, I haven't finished that book. So why bother looking at the repo? But actually you could, you could be doing both. <laughs> yeah. I'd be interested to see like how much has the repo changed since Mastering Bitcoin was, uh, or at least the latest version was published. Um, that's just me thinking aloud, though. Uh, uh, let's get into what you've been working on, on the P2P network, um, specifically around rebroadcasting and other things, and then uh, really working to help educate people uh, around the ways that Bitcoin can be attacked uh, at the P2P level and 
how privacy can be attacked and, and other types of attacks. Why did you decide to focus on on this area particularly? Whew. Um, this is, again, one of those I'm not quite sure. I think early summer I was looking for a project and I had... Oh, okay. Actually, so so the, when applying to the chain code residency, they had given us a code challenge and it was independent of Bitcoin Core, but um, founded in Bitcoin Concepts. And that sparked some curiosity of how does Bitcoin Core solve this problem? And I started digging into the mempool specifically. And, um, and so, so after that, and I had like formed some questions, asked some things. So when I was at Chain Code over the summer looking for a project, I was asking around and John Newberry gave me the idea of this rebroadcast, um, pulling it out from wallet functionality into the node slash mempool level and trying to help uh, the privacy guarantees. So that kind of got me launched on this direction. And as I dug into that project, I've been learning more about P2P and now I'm just like hopelessly fascinated. <laughs> it's so, it's such a cool area. It's deeply nuanced, but also uh, all of the goals of it are really easy to understand. Um, and so I think that level of being able to zoom out to the high level, what are we trying to do here? And zoom into the detailed, okay, now we've got a two second delay versus what would it happen if we had a four second delay? <laughs> or the, like the nitty gritty is quite a challenging thing to be zooming in and out so much, but that's what makes it so fun. And it feels like this intellectual play space. And I, I think I'm gonna be hanging out here for a while. <laughs> So let's do it. Let's zoom out. What are what are the different layers of the P2P network and how they interact and why are they important? Um, so, so I know you watched the Attacking Bitcoin Core talk, so I'll touch on the framework that I shared in that talk as well. Uh, it's something that I've come up with mostly to help myself, um, but now I'm using it as a tool for communication. Uh, is a framework of five different goals that we strive for in the peer-to-peer -peer network and so here they are one is reliability so if you if a node or if someone submits a valid message to the network that message should make it out to all of the nodes eventually two is timeliness that message should get there in a reasonable amount of time and reasonable is pretty arbitrary and it's different for the type of user or the type of message the amount of time that's okay for a miner to get a block is very different than a user to get a transaction. And then three is accessibility in that you, it's great if there's this network that works, but you can't get on to it, then that's pointless. So we want to make everybody who's interested um, able to access the network. And so in Bitcoin, like you can run a node on a Raspberry Pi. We're trying to keep the resource cost quite low. And another aspect is that an adversarial entity can't keep a victim off of the network. So it's not just the um, investment of like hardware, but also that you are in control of your participation. So those are three ideas that I think are probably important for any successful peer to peer network. But in Bitcoin, we have two more. One is the fact that it's private because it's a money. So this is fundamental to what we're trying to do here. And number five is that it's upgradable. And that stems from the ethos of trying to serve all of the different historic software versions. So generally the upgradable thing is a consensus concern, but there are aspects of it that we have to be conscious of in the peer to peer. Right. And, and that's an important point to make too, right? Like we don't need a soft fork or a hard fork to change anything at the P2P network particularly, right? It's usually um, upgradable without that. Sure. Um, 
Yeah, so maybe I can hash out more why I think of upgradability as a P2P concern. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is if, if there is a soft fork and we have um, a new version of software running, then if we had a piece of logic that says, okay, peers are now going to prioritize people, the other nodes that are on this newer version of the software, then um, that could have bad unintended side effects for the nodes that haven't upgraded because they might not be getting the messages as fast. They might not be getting the messages at all. Uh, so that needs to be carefully done to make sure that there's compatibility. So an example of this um, that I'll try to do justice to is WTXID Relay, where we have nodes that talk uh, using the transaction ID hashes. But now that we have SegWit transaction IDs as well, uh, it's hard to basically remember failures accurately to ensure that you're not re-downloading the same transactions. Um, maybe if they have different witnesses or the same witnesses or uh, like basically it's hard to for all of the different software versions to traverse that. And so how we design in the P2P is for even the newest is impacted yeah so older versions of the software uh just being aware of the new types of witnesses or that exist is that uh is that um, correct well it's basically that the new versions of the software still have to be doing txid relay mm -hmm. because the old versions don't know about the segwit transaction yes. ids yeah, mm -hmm. so so you can't just like forget about like, okay, we have this new better way. Let's just do that because you are still supporting the older versions. It needs but to this be, is like a P2P concern. It needs to be backwards compatible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's like consensus so, adjacent. Yeah, adjacent or intertwined. <laughs> Fair enough. It seems like most <laughs> things are intertwined, right? Over there. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> it does seem that way. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, we're, now we're getting down to like granularities of the P2P network. Um, a few that fascinate me, and, or a couple at least, and we were mentioning it before we hit record too, is like Erlay. So Erlay will help out um, significantly with bandwidth, so the ability to, to share the, the full state of the blockchain or download the transactions, receive and send transactions. Um, and this is something Matt and I were actually talking about last week. Um, I'm interested to get your thoughts on. So U-TreeXO, U which would help, uh, if implemented, would help download the blockchain faster. Um, but the trade-off there is bandwidth. So it takes more bandwidth to do that. If we got early first and then U-TreeXO, would that sort of diminish the bandwidth trade-offs that exist now with U-TreeXO? That was a, a question I threw out there last week that we didn't know if we could answer. Maybe you can help us. Um, I don't know the answer offhand. I'm not familiar enough with, honestly, either of the uh, implementations or uh, how they work, but I can I can look into it. <laughs> yeah yeah no don't don't mean to put you on the spot there but no it's just an example of uh the inter intertwined nature of all this stuff like, and that's so that's an another thing that we could touch on now is uh just working on this code base you could be working on something uh in your lane and then you have somebody working on something in another lane and if that gets merged like how how does that throw a wrench in what you're working on have you experienced uh, something where, you, where you've sunk a lot of time into something and something else got merged that sort of uh, forced you to, to change what you're working on in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think usually if you're working on something for a long period of time, you have an idea of other like PRs or open concepts that might be conflicting at a more fundamental level. Because if, if they're trivial, that's no big deal. Um, but 
I, I did have an example like with the SegWit transaction ID relay uh, with my work on rebroadcasting, I am having an additional patch that I've been working on just in a side branch because I don't know which one will get merged first. And so, but the, the two together, even though neither of them is currently there, the two together uh, need a little bit of additional logic. So I had to design to incorporate that. And then I'm, that's currently on a side branch, but whatever, whatever branch doesn't get merged can add this patch. <laughs> uh, so. uh, hmm. Sort of. Yeah. The, uh, the amount of thinking that you guys need to do is, is incredible. Um, so <laughs> let's talk about your rebroadcasting work. What, what, uh, what would this uh, solve and, and why do you think it's important? Yeah. Fundamentally, I think the biggest improvement is around better privacy of mempool transactions. So starting with what is currently on master, the wallet has a behavior where you broadcast a transaction for the first time. And that's great. Hopefully it makes it into mempools. Hopefully it gets mined. But there's a possibility that it didn't actually make it to the network or if we had a more competitive um, fee rate situation or like if it was 2017, for example, transactions might have made it into the mempool and then gotten been forgotten. So you might not be seeing your transaction mined after some amount of time be like, what's up with that? All right, let me tell the network again. So the idea of telling them again is rebroadcasting. And it's there for a good reason. There's a lot of unexpected things that can happen. However, the way it's currently implemented is really bad for privacy because only the wallet that created the transaction um, is the one that, or sorry, not necessarily created, probably created, but basically the only the, the wallet that uh, was the source of the transaction would be the one to broadcast it again. So if an adversary has a couple connections open to you and sees that hey, you told me about this a while ago, you've told me about this again, they can know that you are the source. And further, that the wallet tries to rebroadcast it fairly frequently. So, um, hmm, actually, it's been a while, so I don't remember, but I think maybe every 30 minutes or so. So if, if there's been a, another block in the past 30 minutes, it'll try again. So you could create a low fee rate transaction that you don't actually expect to go out that soon. And then you keep telling the network about it and you give away that you are the source. So that's, that's not great. So I'm trying to make it better. So is this rebroadcasting the same exact transaction or something like a replace by fee situation? Same. Same. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so how are you, how are you attempting to, to solve this and how would it help privacy? So I'm trying to bring it into the node instead of in the wallet. So an element of this is that all nodes will rebroadcast some transactions. And so you could, you could have an idea of all nodes will rebroadcast all transactions and that way nothing's ever uh, missed, but then we come up against bandwidth and that's obviously a very limited resource. So in trying to uh, have nodes rebroadcast transactions that are not just theirs, but also of others that might have been missed or not mined by now, um, there's logic in trying to have that be a set of transactions that is reasonable. So, ones that have a high fee rate, but have been around for a really long time. Something that you think maybe should have been mined by now and yet hasn't showed up in a block. So uh, rebroadcast those. So doing this via the node, would this be like a particular node setup that is looking for these types of transactions or would every node with the software um, be looking for these rebroadcasts? I think in the long-term vision, uh, if, if it's done correctly, we could have every node 
attempting rebroadcast. It's pretty much like if you think of a wallet and a mempool as different components, the mempool is one of the big uh, like responsibilities that it has is trying to relay transactions so that they can be mined, right? If you're a miner, then your mempool serves you so you can mine them. But if you're an ordinary node that is running with a mempool and a lot of what you're doing, there's some things that serve you like with fee estimation, for example, but there's an aspect where you're also serving the network and trying to help uh, transactions propagate. So it kind of makes sense uh, from looking at it that way that, hey, I have this transaction. I don't know where it came from, but it doesn't seem to be getting mined and it's been around for a really long time. It's at the highest fee rate, like maybe it got missed, but I have it. So let me tell the network about it again. Okay, so, all right. Yeah, initially I'm gonna put it behind a uh, basically kill switch so people can like enable the behavior just so we can kind of roll out more cautiously. But I think in the long-term vision, it makes sense. All right. So I think this makes a lot more sense to me now that you just described it that way. So it's not the end user who uh, is rebroadcast or who may have sent the transaction originally. It's the nodes looking out for these and they're just doing it on behalf of them so that they don't have to do it again so that their privacy is helped a little bit. Yeah. And so if you're a spy, you wouldn't know. Maybe it's the end user. Maybe it's a random user, et cetera. Yeah. And I guess we should get into the nature of mempools here too, right? Because each node has a different mempool. And how how does that sort of come into play? Um, yeah, there's it's a interesting concept to initially wrap your head around of what it actually means. Like we, we love referring to it as the mempool. And you can easily Google and be like, what is in the mempool? <laughs> Uh, but every single node that's running Bitcoin has a different mempool. Uh, you can disable your mempool if you want, or you can have a ginormous one that saves all of the transactions, which if I were a miner is definitely what I would do. <laughs> and most people have some something somewhere in between, but there are a lot of configurations that you can have for your mempool. And so keeping those consistent but also independent and slightly different is something that creates a lot of nuance to peer-to-peer -peer behavior and interactions and there's also elements of um, privacy because you don't want ideally if you could have every single person's mempool uh, have a transaction show up at exactly the same time that would be ideal for privacy but that's not how computers work so we add a lot of these random time delays in propagation or sometimes even until recently we had a uh, mechanism that after transactions were 15, approximately 15 minutes old, you would no longer serve them. Um, so there are all of these different kinds of bounds, but we got rid of that upper limit. But you still, you might have a transaction in your mempool and somebody asks it for you, but it's too new. And so you don't want to reveal that you have it. So you don't give it to them yet. So there's a lot of different components. There's the difference between just like network delay and propagation lags. There's the element of configuration of the end users. And there's elements of privacy. So not immediately revealing what you have and what you don't have. And so we have to design with all of these different things in mind. Oh, and software versions. <laughs> why would you Why would you not want to share uh, a transaction because it may be too early? You may have not had it for long enough. Because that could help if, if you were an adversary and you were trying to figure out um, who the source was that initially broadcast the transaction. Uh. You could just connect to as many peers on the network. And if you could find out exactly when the transaction showed up in their mempool, then that would give you a lot of data that over time you could probably use to like triangulate the source. Um, or you could basically say, okay, it's in these five mempools, but nobody else. That's clearly one in five of those is the source. Okay. So That's fascinating. So I have a I question. Never knew the 
Um, sorry, Marty. Uh, You're good. So with all these intricacies of, of the P2P layer, um, you know, at Tales from the Crypt, we're big advocates of people using their own node. I think it's unquestionably better for privacy on the receiving side, looking up your balances, receiving transactions. But when it comes to sending, um, for the time being, like if it's a, if if you really want to take the the best privacy precautions, wouldn't using like a third party transaction broadcaster, something like Blockstream.infos, with like connected through Tor, don't you do? Is that is that's a better privacy option, right? Would you not agree? Um. So I'm not fully familiar with um, like that flow, so I can't make any like super strong claims. But I think there's a lot of options for how private you are. For example, you could have a uh, offline computer running a Bitcoin node, form a transaction, and sign it, and then you could send that transaction via carrier pigeon to your friend. Right, that's <laughs> who what I'm saying. then broadcasts it. <laughs> Something like that, like broadcasting, like, intentionally not broadcasting from your own node. Because yeah. you, you can you can create a signed transaction and you can broadcast that from, from anybody else's node if you wanted to. Is, right. that, is that what TXT cast would do? Or TX cast that 6102 is working on? Or is that still coming from your own node just... Trying he, to mess with he the might time. have linked in because blockstream.info has an API for a transaction broadcaster where they do it from their node. So he might have linked mm-hmm. it in. But I know the main premise is that it tries to defeat timing analysis by staggering the transactions when they, they eventually get broadcasted. It might use your own node, though. I'm not sure. Uh, or maybe yeah. it's an option of the two. Hmm, interesting. <sighs> It's crazy the intricacies you have to think of when when sending and receiving uh, Bitcoin transactions, especially if you're trying to remain private. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that as a user, I mean, there's so many layers of privacy. um, And I think that as a user, both how you broadcast a transaction as well as how you create the transaction using your UTXO set and trying to um, not do the most obvious behavior is probably two of the most impactful aspects that you could focus on. Yeah. That's why I think coin selection is huge and PSBT is huge as well. Um, Those are two things that I I really want to see in a wallet, like the ability to choose which UTXOs I'm sending and then the ability to, to, uh, to form a transaction offline and just broadcast it um, and sign it. Yeah. I think it'd be cool if a wallet had like a really beautiful visual interface for coin selection. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Yeah, we're not there yet. And we're still really young. We got time. Andrew Chow, <laughs> Andrew Chow, who I think is younger than all of us, said that it's never going to happen. There's no such thing as user friendly uh, coin coin control. All right, Andrew. Let's be more optimistic. No, no let's. Let's let's get him on here right now. I'll disagree. That's we're just just because we're not there yet doesn't mean we can't have it. You're this like, is <laughs> this is the mentality I like, Amidi. This is the, the <laughs> mentality I try to have. It's like like you said, like we're still so young. To me, it's crazy that we've gotten this far. That we've gotten people like you interested in actually contributing to the protocol and, and spending your life doing it. Now at this point, <laughs> you're getting paid to do it. Um, I think people hate on how far Bitcoin's come to this point. So how early are we and how far have we come just in the year that you've been, been Hmm. working uh, on the core code base? I mean, it's really diving into the GitHub project and seeing the repo has time and time again shown me, wow, this is a really young project. And we were talking a little bit before we started recording about how it was really surprising when I learned how bad the rebroadcast behavior currently is, um, how much of a leak that is, because that's not something I ever knew about till I was asking around and um, at the chain code residency, et cetera. And, but then I've had a really warm reception uh, from people who have been excited to review my PR or help me implement, et cetera, because they also like, like in terms of core contributors, they also agree. Um, And that's, 
felt very disjointed from some of the academic research that we have, like Dandelion that's looking for uh, initial uh, broadcasts being entirely private and not able to uh, de-anonymize that if you're an adversary. And I think that there's actually quite a bit of low-hanging fruit in the Bitcoin core repo in terms of things like better commenting and documentation for some of the behaviors or there are so many areas where our automated tests are um, can be improved. And it's definitely hard as an individual to identify exactly what those areas are and um, do them yourself. But it's been surprising that over just a year, uh, and I, I literally never looked at C++ <laughs> before Bitcoin Core. So it was very intimidating. And that too, I've never professionally worked in a low level programming language. It's all been like, little application software stuff and so it's constantly amazing to me to see that I'm able to make changes that are helpful and I see the fact that my timeline has been pretty quick as more of a product of the fact that it is a very young project and reviews thoughtful interaction um, is highly highly desirable yeah, no, and I think over the last two to three years particularly, it has been very encouraging to me to see companies like Zappo, like Square Crypto, like Chain Code. Uh, I mean, obviously Chain Code, Blockstream, a c- couple others, Digital Garage, uh, been around for a while, but it seems like more and more companies are starting to realize like, hey, this protocol's been around for more than a decade. It'll probably be around for a little bit longer at least, so if we're going to be using it, it's probably important to to reinvest uh, in it by supporting it with, with developers who are looking to work on it full time. And, and this is just me ranting and commenting right now. Like, I just think we're, we're about to, or we are hitting a sort of inflection point of reinvestment in the protocol by companies that are leveraging it. And I don't think we've seen the full, uh, benefits of that yet. Um, and they're only going to get stronger from here on out. Yeah, totally. It's definitely exciting to see, more and more organizations get involved with sponsoring core development. And I think it's really important because it is so complex. Like uh, as an individual, you need a long, long amount of constant time to be able to really engage in it, you know? Yeah. Now you were, uh, you were mentioning like the low level testing on, uh, at, at, uh, for the core protocol. And it's just reminding me of our conversation with uh, Valerie and Matt Carallo about fuzzing test. Um, w- w- can you explain what a fuzzing test is again for the freaks out there? Um, <laughs> uh, and they've been approving too, haven't they? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely fuzzing has been an area that's gotten more attention and improvements recently. The idea basically is that you, I mean, there's two ways to, okay, probably more than two ways, but the normal way that you test edge cases is you say, oh, well, this could go wrong. Let me mimic that and ensure that if it were to go wrong, uh, it would handle it in a sane sort of behavior. Fuzzing is a different approach, and it pretty much says, hey, computer, do random stuff and throw it at the code, and let's see what happens. <laughs> Um, and so, and so that can reveal things that people didn't think about because it's more of a kind of brute forcey way. And I think it has been revealing like some edge cases. And so I think it's a, I think it's a sign of a maturing project as well. I think that most um, bigger projects at some point incorporate this. And so it's awesome that we're now doing that. Yeah, and uh, Val Wallace, I want to be apologize for calling you Valerie, not Valentine. I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, brain fart there. Um, so going back to your rebroadcasting work, like what what needs to be done to to get this implemented? Obviously, it's getting reviewed right now. Um, what uh, what are like the next steps? You, you said you you have two other. M- uh, 
PRs that are out there that could affect it? Are you, are you waiting on those? Or are you just going to go um, without waiting on those? Well, okay. So, so I had a big PR that was like, here's rebroadcast. And I got some awesome reviews and I got some feedback as well. And GMAX had left a review that gave an idea of how I could break out one of the pieces of functionality from the main PR. And so that's what my current uh, PR is. So basically it's a subset of the rebroadcast, but that just makes it easier to review, easier to get merged. Um, hopefully I've gotten a few acts on that. So I hope that it's getting, getting pretty close to being merged. And then I'll go back to the main one to con see out the rest of the project. Um, but along the way, I've been, you know, experiencing some scenic routes, <laughs> a lot of learning. Like there was one element where I was trying to, I was basically just trying to make a behavior testable from the functional tests. And that was in relation to how things are scheduled. And that led to its own PR that went through different iterations and eventually we eventually led to a bug in a boost library uh, <laughs> being discovered. <laughs> so yeah, that was, that was kind of beyond my depth, but luckily I had a lot of really smart and focused uh, Bitcoin core contributors just jump on it and debug and investigate. <laughs> so is that, a library that's not related to Bitcoin directly or is Bitcoin just leveraging? Uh, yeah, so it's a it's a dependency. So we yeah. have the boost library in Bitcoin. We're trying to move away from it, um, but it's currently like a dependency. No, that's the uh, that's the crazy thing. You have so many smart people working on Bitcoin. They're fixing other people's code too. Oh, yeah, I felt very grateful because I was just like, I have no clue what's happening here. <laughs> <laughs> That is, um, no, that's why, I mean, another tangent here. That's why I'm happy Carl Dong's working on the Geeks containers and <laughs> trying to mitigate the dependencies that go into all this. Again, yeah. so many. There's so many cool projects that are working, um, that are being worked on. And I, like, I think that's another aspect where that's really important work, but there's a different sort of time scale and it's a sign of the project maturing. Yeah. So what, um, if, everything goes well with your re rebroadcasting PRs. What, uh, what are you going to move on to next? Do you think? <laughs> I mean, I still have a, a, a fairly long way to go. Um, once I do the, I'm get the subset merged. There is more work that has been brought up, um, for the main project. So there's some time before I exactly identify, but I think in general, I'm just, deeply captivated by the peer to peer space. And it's a very complex, nuanced area that very few people are actually familiar with. So I think continuing down that road and trying to understand all the different behaviors and um, do thoughtful reviews, which is just like, leaving a good review is so, so valuable. It's the singular most valuable thing that you could do to advance like the Bitcoin core project. Um, but it takes a lot of just work behind the scenes of familiarizing with the code base. And so I feel like that's a lot of what I spend my time on. I'm looking at people's PRs. I'm often looking even at historic PRs that have changed um, the behavior, even if they've been merged to try to understand different iterations and reasoning behind behaviors. So like, like a PR that was merged a couple of versions ago um, was having up in, in transaction download was preferring outbound, uh, preferring downloading a transaction from an outbound peer over an inbound peer because you, it's harder for an adversary to have been running a node and then when you start your node, you happen to request them to form the connection. It's a lot easier for them to just say, hey, you accept incoming, let me connect to you. Mm -hmm. And so for um, 
specifically privacy, but also different sorts of uh, guarantees, we prefer downloading transactions from outbound peers. Um, so there's, there was a rework that was done a couple versions ago that added that um, discrepancy between the two groups. So that's something that I've really dug into and been looking very closely at recently, but um, doesn't actually lead to necessarily leaving a review or making a PR, but I think does help pour the foundation for me to be able to do those things better. Yeah. And this may sound like a stupid question, but does like port forwarding or 8333 port, excuse me, like if more and more people do that, does that reduce the overall risk of, of getting fed, fed bad information from, from another node hmm. or getting attacked, like partition attacked? Hmm. I don't know. Something because I mean, because it's not, it's not straightforward. Most people don't have that port forwarded. And so you're saying that's just something I'm accepting inbound connections. If more nodes accepted inbound connections, yes. Oh, I yeah. see. Um, I mean, I think it's different. Like, if more nodes accepted inbound connections, then I think that it's in certain ways, making you more robust. For example, you have more peers that you're interacting with, getting transactions from There's mm -hmm. probably more honest peers, but then in other ways, it makes you more vulnerable. For example, if a node is uh, able to figure out a vulnerability that involves rapidly disconnecting and reconnecting, they wouldn't be able to do that if you only accepted, or if you didn't accept inbound peers, um, so it's as with everything, kind of a trade-off. It's a nuance. Yeah. No, it's just something I'm curious about. But, um, one thing I want to talk to you about is like, so beyond the development aspect of it, like, what are your, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Just the, the, I don't want to say movement, but like the project overall, the asset, um, like, do you, do you think it's an imperative technology today? Or are you just sort of more interested in it because of the development aspect? <laughs> yeah, I don't really think Bitcoin matters. <laughs> That's, um, obviously, I think that yeah, I, I've had I've had developers <laughs> come on here and just be like, I, I just like it as an engineering project. Really? So, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> um, no, I think that I mean part of what makes me so excited to work on it every day. Like, there's there's the two sides of it. One is just this as an engineer, nerding out intellectually is challenging. But the other side of it is that I think the work has so much impact or like so much potential for impact. Uh, I think that it's like, I think it's only a matter of time that our world has a global currency. Um, and the world that I like to live in has a sound global currency. And I think Bitcoin's the only experiment that I've seen that's even moving in that direction. And so hopefully, like, I'd really, really like it if we were able to succeed and um, see through this vision of, like, you know, censorship resistance, I think is one of the really fundamental ones. Um, but also, yeah, just the ability for everybody to participate in it. And so I think that really compels me to work on the project because it feels like the small actions I'm doing are bigger than those actions themselves. And so that's very exciting to work on, on a daily basis. Yeah. I can't imagine how fulfilling that is. And so what are you, given what are you talking about? You, you, you do it too. <laughs> uh, I just, I mean, yeah, I do love doing this. This is, it's a labor of love, the podcast and the, uh, and the newsletter, but, um, I don't know, right. Writing the code and act that actually makes it work. seems like it, it's, it's, uh, it's got to be a certain type of feeling, a certain type of feel there when you get something merged. It's like, ah, the software people downloading that is Bitcoin. I hope that. I think that's pretty dope. Yeah, it definitely is rewarding. But I also find um, educational initiatives and communicating about it rewarding because I think that there's a software component, but for Bitcoin to be successful, it's really just about ubiquitousness. 
because it's money. At the end of the day, if people use it, it, it succeeds. Um, and so I think that a really, really crucial component is the, getting that message out and having people understand why it's valuable or how it works or how to interact with it. And when we're talking about how early the project is, I think that's a huge sign of it. There's a lot of constant like, like, oh my gosh, I don't understand everything, so I must not understand anything. Um, I don't, I don't know what's going on here. And I think a lot of people disengage because of that. And so I think for those of us who do know a little bit or are curious, I think we have a lot of work to do to uh, spread the fundamentals, spread the enthusiasm, et cetera. I agree. I agree there. Um, <laughs> and I think it's happening. At least uh, I think more minds are getting infected with the Bitcoin virus. The virus is spreading. Yeah. Bad timing to, to talk about spreading viruses, but whatever. The meme's been around for a while. Um, when it comes to the network and uh, like, do you think uh, we're, we're on a good trajectory for it to, to be successful in the long run? Like, do you think we're um, being as efficient enough with the chain state, with uh, making sure that full nodes uh, are going to be able to be downloaded in areas with, with worse internet? Um, do you think... Uh, the uh, the necessities of which make this protocol successful in the long run are are there right now and they're they're being sort of focused on enough. Hmm. Uh, that is such a hard question to answer. Um, who knows? I mean, I think part of what is really crucial for Bitcoin to succeed is not just the robustness of the base layer, but also. Uh, layer two and possibly in, in the long-term future more layers on top um, because I think that like that really helps with usability and so the fact that there is so much development in the lightning space and there's so much excitement in the lightning space is really promising as well um, but it's so hard to know like what is sufficient in order to achieve what we're striving for and it's also because it's a moving target, right? Like the development of infrastructure is constantly changing. So five years from now, our chain might be bigger, but also maybe um, our bandwidth, like expectations are larger as well. I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't really, I don't really spend too much time thinking about that. I really just try to look at what we have and how to make it as good as possible. Um, but I think that there's a lot of development that's iterative, but there's also a lot of like stair steps, like what we were talking about earlier with Erle or UTXO. Like if we're able to get something like one of those merged, those have huge impact on or whether it be block download time or um, reconciliation and bandwidth usage or whatever different dimensions. But then those come off with a whole set of trade-offs as well. So. There's like so many branches to the thought tree of possibilities. <laughs> it's hard to play them out. No, no. I, I, I mean, that's why I always love talking to developers because it, it, it um, Bitcoin just as an engineering problem, it, everybody's you, like, I just saw you like running to your mind of like scenarios <laughs> that could play out if all this stuff happens. It's, it's never boring. It seems um, it's, but and on the content side, it's never boring, boring. Oh, either. There's always, though always something to write about and that's and honestly i'd be more curious uh, about to hear your take on that same question because i feel like i because i am quite new um i don't feel like i have a very big volume of understanding like i've just really dug into one one area uh but i you know you've you've been at it for a while you've talked to so many different people what do you what do you think <laughs> I mean, like you, I'm I'm an optimist. I think we're I th I think I don't think people give Bitcoin enough credit. I think it, it's incredibly uh, amazing how far it's come to date. If you like, I've been reading about and studying Bitcoin since like 2013, and the strides it's made since then have been enormous. Like if like just the the so those wallet software, the fact that the Lightning Network exists. The, most importantly to me, it's uh, the fact that uh, more and more developers are coming and being intrigued by the protocol. 
uh, year in and year out. Whereas in like 2014, 2015, when there was a bunch of rage quits and it seemed mm-hmm. like uh, interest in, in Bitcoin was dying. Like 2015, Matt, like the summer, fall of 2015 was a pretty dire time. Like, well, like December 2015. Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty yeah. bad. Oh, interesting. And, and to see where it is now. And it's, I mean, I, I think it's gone. I think it's part of the culture now. I think people know what Bitcoin is. Yeah. What do you think, Matt? I'm bullish as fuck. I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I wouldn't be here if I didn't think we could do it. Yeah. <laughs> be a waste of time yeah <laughs> yeah i agree um no yeah I, i'm like i think people are too hard on bitcoin it's amazing that it's still producing blocks and people are still coming uh to learn about it and to buy some of it and to download full nodes and to and that's what matt mainly i, I just try to help out uh in in uh being being a being a sort of platform to push this stuff, uh, like privacy stuff, like coin join, see more people coin join, especially during this quarantine. We've seen the number of, of lightning nodes go up. So it seems like, Oh, uh, cool. Peop- yeah. It seems like people who tour lightning uh, nodes too. That's yeah. Really good. So actually I think if this quarantine is good for anything, it's that people who may have been a little bit apprehensive to, to get into the, the dirty side of downloading a full node and trying to figure out how to, do Bitcoin the right way or start an experiment with that. And that's very encouraging to me. Um, that's super cool. Uh, yeah. And so I guess question I have the, the, uh, the round out question we're going to have here is like, if there's any freak listening to this, who's may have been or may be apprehensive to sort of jumping into the fray of Bitcoin core development, like what, type of encouragement or advice would you give them? I know we've talked about some of it, but is there anything we missed um, that that you think uh, anybody looking to jump into this should know? Yeah. Um, well, for my full brain download, that's the, bl- the blog post that I wrote about onboarding. And I think that's just like packed with different things that I found helpful. But overall, I think it's, Mostly the mentality, it's definitely terrifying, but if you're truly willing to and interested, then you can do it. And if you can believe you can do it, then taking small steps and finding a focus. So the first one is to download the repo and build it and run tests. And after that, like start familiarizing yourself with what issues are being opened and what PRs are being made. and finding excuses to look in the code um, at whatever interests you. Because I think that's part of what's so cool. I am able to use my own excitement as a guide. And I think a lot of people have a lot of excitement for great reasons. And so just follow what compels you and dig deep and ask questions along the way. And I think that, I think that you'd be surprised at how that could play out incredible advice you're, you're such a, a you're such a pleasant person to have in this space <laughs> like just thinking about like the twitter i mean I, i'm part of the twitter uh noise sometimes but uh <laughs> like somebody who's just optimistic and humble and uh sort of took the bull by the horns and jumped into this it's this has been a pleasure oh matt, thanks do have, <laughs> matt do you have anything else you want to add before we wrap here well i mean i wish we were doing this in person i would I would love a follow-up yeah. in person when this all clears. I w- definitely. That, that sounds good. We have a lot more to chat about. <laughs> I, you definitely will. Definitely um, I'm going to keep a, a lookout on your rebroadcasting PRs and very, very much looking forward to seeing that. Thank you for working on that stuff because we're, we're big on privacy here at TFTC. So anybody who's working to make uh, the privacy of individual Bitcoiners better is A-OK in my book. Me, Amidi, thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. All right. Peace and love, freaks. Take <laughs>